All right. Um, hey, folks, uh, this is the fourth um, in the four part series talking about um, open source. So we start, started with Kelsey um, uh, originally to talk, talk all about, uh, you know, why you should participate in the open source communities. Then we heard from Chris talking about how you can participate, getting organizations involved, building the muscle of doing your own inner sourcing. Then we just heard from Dean to talk about how you can help grow your open source communities, um, how you can do evangelism, how you can make everybody feel inclusive and, and part of it. Um, and now uh, we've got Jared Dillon, who's going to be talking about um, putting all those pieces together. He's going to be specifically talking about the Kudo project, uh, which uh, recently was uh, brought into the CNCF. Congrats, uh, Jared and, and community for that. Um, and he's going to be talking about all, all the things that were necessary to do that as, as they kind of started from the inception and, and, and got to that point. Um, and Jared, I am attempting to beat your beard, but I am trying. Yeah, I'm not there yet. It's, this is my COVID beard needs to, to to get a little bit more, but my hair is getting out of control. So you know, I guess that's that's good. We'll, we'll we'll give you till winter. You'll you'll catch up. All right, good, good. Um, anyway, I really really glad to have you here. Um, for everybody, uh, uh, Jared's been involved in the Kubernetes community from from the early days, um, and you know, in particular, uh, he's been focused a lot on things on the operator side of of, of the house. Um, uh, he's the co-chair of, of the, the operators uh, working uh, 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 the CNCF operator working group. Working yep. group. Yeah, the working group. Um, and they're doing a lot of really, really great stuff. So, Jared, with that, I'll hand it over and looking forward to uh, hearing everything you had to say. Fantastic. Thank you, Ben. Uh, let me share my slides. Let's see, how is this going to work? All right, uh, let me hit play. And does that show up okay, um, the full screen? Uh, the full screen is not showing up. Hang on one second. Let's see here. You know what? I'm gonna have to do it with the Chrome. It looks like, I'm... there we go. I just do my entire screen. Much better. There we go. Does that look okay for everyone? Looks great, Jared. Thanks. Fantastic. So uh, thanks, Ben. Yeah, uh, so I'd love to spend a little while talking about uh, the Kudo uh, open source project and uh, and a bit of a case study around it. So uh, real quick, I'll do a little introduction, and then I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the problem that we, we set out to solve and, and, and why, uh, you know, why we even started this project, right? And then from there, it's a, we you get into a conversation of why did we open source it, and 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 why was that important to us? Uh, and then walk through a little bit of a history of Kudo and where where it is today, um, and then talk a little bit about how we actually do open source project management. And then, as Ben said, get a bit to the bit of the the growth and building a community around that, and how we on Kudo did that. And then at the end, we'll uh, we'll do some Q and A. So who am I? Uh, ben did a pretty good job. Uh, I'm an application developer that about eight years ago, got into infrastructure engineering and uh, decided I really wanted to solve uh, infrastructure problems with software. Uh, so I, I, I uh, was the initial creator of and core contributor to Kudo. Um, I also was a very early contributor to Helm uh, back uh, about four-ish years ago. Um, and then I, I've been doing Kubernetes since, since very early, since pre 1.0. Um, and I co-chair the CNCF operator working group. I emeritus chair of CNCF contributor strategy, which is a uh, SIG and the CNCF focused on growing contributors and, and, and growing uh, growing all the projects within the CNCF. And I'm active in SIG architecture and a few other sub-projects, and, and that slide unfortunately cut off. So I want to talk about a little bit behind the problem and how you get to something like to the point of, of why I might want to start an open source project. So if we start about what Kubernetes is, right, it's, it's declarative data that is operated on by a series of controllers. And this is very a very unique place to be that uh, Kubernetes is extensible unless you, you represent data however you want, right? And so given a Kubernetes controller, like what you know, what is this concept? So you know, given the state of something I care about in Kubernetes changes and some observed state and my desired state, I want to start advancing that resource from my from my inferred state or my observed state to that desired state. 
And if you really understand the slide, then you understand all of what uh, what what I'm about to say about Kubernetes and operators, and and you really know the core heart, heart, uh, beating heart of this project. So. I spend a lot of my time talking about operators, and uh, you know, operator is a, a very anomalous term to actually define. And one of the one of the work we're doing up in the CNCF is actually working on a definition of that operator. Uh, I dropped a slide on, uh, uh, on accident, but I want to present one way I like to think about it, um, and that is application awareness. Right? If I'm building really complicated software. Uh, I need to think about how my application interacts with other applications of its kind. This is really important in clustered software like Cassandra or clustered Postgres, where these things are connected to each other, right? And so how does one Cassandra node interact with another Cassandra node? And there's rules for that. And there's things that you need to do when that contract breaks. And then how your application interacts with applications it depends upon. That's really important to be aware of that. How your application backs up its data, how your application scales up and down, and what it needs to do when it restarts. Uh, these are all very important things. So really, and 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 there's much longer forms of this talk I give, but just to get through the, the problem here, an operator is really a controller that is well optimized for the requirements of its domain. And that's really important about, uh, at, at this thought. And we're working on this work upstream right now to help come up with a solid definition for the CNC event user community. Uh, but that's how I like to think of it. So great, Jared, you've sold me. Let's let's operator everything. Uh, you know, Postgres, let's write an operator. Migrations, let's write an operator. Backups and store, write an operator, right? We can just we can start applying this pattern to a lot of things. Um, that's great. So let's go do that for my database, right? A hundred thousand lines of my code and maybe ten thousand lines of operator code. And I'll show later it's actually much more code than that and and start to, to reveal the problem here. Um, okay, web service, 10,000 lines in my code. Well, maybe I, maybe I want to, it's a Rails app, and I want to uh, write an operator for my migrations. Ah, oh, well, that's another 10,000 lines of code. Microservice, you know, microservice. Suddenly, suddenly the economics of this switch really quickly. And like, well, I can't, I can't write all these operators for everything, and you're going to go crazy. You know, a really concrete example of this, this is, a, this is now a bit old, but Elastic on Kubernetes needs, a, needs you know, 53,000 lines of code and even more now to maintain that. And someone needs to write and maintain and, and deliver all of that code. And you think everything is fine and you've got this all set up and then a new Kubernetes version comes out and you have to update everything in your code base. So this really turns into a full-time problem for a full-time engineering problem. And we've started to notice this out there that building operators was very hard because we have an accessibility problem in actually writing operators. Um, so we, st we, st we started to observe this. Okay, what do we do? What do we do? Uh, you know, people need to know way too much about Kubernetes. Uh, there's not enough operators doing enough things because of that need, need for expertise. And really, we're not treating Kubernetes as a, as a programming model uh, that, that really that a lot of work is going into enabling for people. So, okay. Well, with that, we ended up creating the Kubernetes Universal Declarative Operator. Uh, kudo. So it was. It's it's been in around since September of 2018, and I'll walk through the history of it a bit. But this was created in order to solve that problem we saw out in the community. So we're focused on orchestration of Kubernetes primitives, including other operators. It's all about day two and shipping your application with a drone book, and then promoting application awareness and using of application native tooling instead of rewriting it and go, right? And it's not the right tool for everything. It's more of an orchestration tool. But the most, most important thing is we are open governance, open community, and, and everything is open source. And it's all just Kubernetes. So why would we make this an open source project, right? This sounds like something that's very valuable to solve. Um, and, it's, and one thing that's important to remember uh, or know about open source is part of what you can do is, is start to uh, grow markets or, 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 or drive standards. So operators, especially stateful services on Kubernetes, is a niche within a niche, right? You have you have that niche of people who one want to use operators and two run something that has state on it. Uh, and then we wanted to really help drive the growth of that operator market and see what what all it could really do and and, and drive more users onto Kubernetes. Uh, and figuring that more more people are able to deploy more services on Kubernetes also accelerates the growth of Kubernetes as well. We also wanted to make this more accessible. We wanted to bring more developers into Kubernetes instead of having a, most developers or a lot of developers tiptoe their way around Kubernetes and, and think in terms of lift and shift. We, we, we set out really believing in the Kubernetes resource model as a way to build large-scale software and infrastructures and make those things much more integrated. 
And we wanted to just bring more, like I said, bring more staple services to Kubernetes. So a quick history of how uh, you know going about that. Uh, we created it in September of 2018. Uh, we announced it in November. Uh, and then in May, I think May of 2019, I need to go check the dates, but around there, we started the CNCF donation process. Um, we went generally available with it in November. And then uh, in 20, March, I think, of 2020, the uh, CNCF operator group started spinning up. Uh, it may have been April. Um, and then in July of 2020, uh, last month, we were, we were accepted in the CNCF sandbox. And uh, we went through a long process in doing that. But along the way, uh, you know, the CNCF processes grew and... Uh, and, and you know, they've worked with us as a fantastic partner throughout that entire process. Uh, so what does growing a project like Kudo like, look like, right? It's, it's it, you know, Open source is not one of those build it and they will come things. It works like any other product you might think of. And, and part of that is marketing. Part of it's also getting it right. But there's a large amount of go talk about it, get users, get customers, right? And what we did with Kudo was, as we were building this out, to make sure that we weren't building ourselves into a hole, we started off and gave hundreds of meetups and conference talks, uh, going on to podcasts, everywhere we could talk about it, to start bringing users into the door to tell us e even early on what's wrong with it, how can we get you to use it, right? And then alongside of that, we wanted to be symbiotic with the community. So it required very active participation in Kubernetes SIGs, CNCF SIGs. And for those who don't know, uh, Kubernetes and the CNCF both have this special interest group system where if you're interested in a particular area of Kubernetes, and I work very heavily in app delivery and uh, API machinery in Kubernetes uh, and app delivery in the CNCF, that is where you know, birds of a feather sort of flock and work on projects and new things and maintain all of these projects, right? So we presented to, to the relevant SIGs and and talk to those special interest groups, find found out some of the problems, and started to get some of our initial users from that. The, the people who are the far left of the, the innovators curve, right? The uh, the uh, innovators, or early adopters, uh, and, 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 and figured out exactly you know, what they wanted to do, what they didn't want to use, right? Uh, the other really important thing we did from the get-go, uh, because we knew we wanted to make this open source, not just open source, but open governance and a real community project, we set it up to be a very welcoming, inclusive, inclusive community for contributors and users from the get-go. And I'll talk about a little bit more of how we actually go about that, but it is very easy for someone to come into the, the Kudo community and be immediately uh, productive and, 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 and feel welcome. Uh, and we just talked to possible customers. Uh, and really for us, those are just end users. But uh, again, hundreds of customers. We, we wanted to know what problems people were trying to solve, right? This looks no different than any other product. It just happens to be open source. Uh, and, 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 and part of understanding that is understanding the problem domain you're in. And uh, by the time you do a couple hundred talks about people running stable service on Kubernetes, you have a pretty good idea of, of what the problems are. And we got blindsided by a lot of things that we didn't even think of. Uh, I, I feel a lot of the time people go into open source thinking that they have a vision, they're going to create a library for something. And that's fine. Uh, but you may discover in all these talks that you're going to find all these use cases. And a few hours of talking can save you a few weeks of coding. Uh, and then a healthy contributor base is as important as a healthy user base. Uh, this, For one, this is a, you know, as, as Kudo goes through that process, we need contributors from multiple companies. Uh, we need, we need much, lots of users using it. But most importantly, uh, it cannot just be one company behind the project, right? It, it needs to be uh, a lot of healthy, active contributors in order to ensure that long-term health of, of the project and make sure everyone's voices are heard and, and really we're taking all the feedback in stride. So one thing we discovered as we were going about this pro process is we, we, we had to make a bit of a direction shift, right? Kudos is ultimately about solving a problem. And we didn't want to say, okay, well, if uh, if... You, you don't want to use this for writing Kafka, a Kafka operator. Well, you can't use it, right? So we had people come into our Slack and, and open issues over and over and over again. We had someone wanting to orchestrate his Ruby on Rails app. We have another company wanting to orchestrate a series of dozens of micro that all need some sort of ordering guarantee. Uh, there, it turns out people wanted to orchestrate things on Kubernetes and have day two access to that. Now, there's a couple of workflow systems out there for Kubernetes, but none that think of it in real time as an operator and focuses on drift. They typically do that operation 
maybe on a deploy, right? Or maybe maybe when some sort of pipeline runs. And if you think about think about that, like Argo is a good example of that. But some people do want that operator like experience for it. And then we kept hearing this over and over and over again, right? And what we really discovered is stateful services, not many people wanted to build operators for stateful services because it's still a niche on a niche of a niche. Uh, you you have you have you know storage companies that are still working through some maturity uh, you know, growing in maturity levels, uh, you know, and and really there's just not that many vendors out there and just not that many data-driven projects out there compared to the number of applications, right? Again, niche of a niche. Uh, and then the user, we found that the users just tell us where they want us to go. And uh, it turns sometimes the best thing you can do is is listen to your users. And we continue to listen to our users and uh, something funny happened. We have a, a Kudo test framework. Uh, and Kudo test provides a really great tool for testing operators. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a partial YAML assertion framework where it will try to create a resource. And then you can go assert that, yes, I do have three pods after, after I created that resource. Great. And uh, it's very, very useful when you create, say, an operator, a type of Kafka broker, or I'm sorry, yeah, Kafka broker, and you want to see a pod show up, right? And we quickly discovered by people poking around and asking us that this was just not limited to Kudo. People wanted to use this to test their Helm charts. Uh, the operator framework team wanted to use it to, to test operators for Operator Hub. And uh, we even showed it up to uh, SIG testing in the, in for, to replace the Kubernetes end-to-end -end testing. And we, we, we want to keep showing that to them, and we're, we're working through that process. Um, but tons of people wanted to use it. So we extracted this into the Kubernetes test tool. Um, it's at cuddle.dev. And you know, one of the cool things about starting this open source project, if we hadn't open sourced that and we hadn't been talking to our users, we would have never known that this could have been its own thing, right? And and that that extraction is a fantastic example of even how just doing something open source can spawn out other open source projects. And this was accepted in the CNCF sandbox as well under the Kudo umbrella. Um, but it's, and, and I also wanted to be able to say, uh, cube cuddle cuddle on stage at some point so i've done it now um and uh it we're, we're you know what this tool is about is helping drive scoring and conformance for operators right and we we now have a you know someone actively going and talking to customers and going and figuring out what they need uh everywhere that they can and and, and making this one of the best test tools for kubernetes out there so just a, just some quick metrics. Kudo today, we, we've worked our way up to you know, GitHub, GitHub stars aren't everything, but we do have a, a really good trajectory uh, of, of stars, contributors, and, and use of dozens of companies. And most importantly, none of that came for free, right? That was that was a lot of a um, lot of being out there and a lot of being in front of people, uh, continuously talking about it, continuously getting that feedback. So I want to take a break from that for a moment uh, and chat a little bit about. Um, Open source project management, because the way you actually start to you know, reify a lot of your ideas happens in a bit of a different way. If you look at the Kubernetes project and you look at the Kudo project, and some of this was was finding a process that works for your contributors. Uh, one, one of the one of the interesting things that the the CNCF has done and Kubernetes has done has put. Uh, project above company, right? And so there's no one way you can just sort of enforce work going on. Uh, and, and one of the amazing things is, is you have an entire ecosystem of vendors and end users all working on the same project, you know, not pointing their guns at each other. They're all working together to actually build something fantastic. Now, how do you tactically do that, right? And uh, in Kubernetes, we solve that through Kubernetes enhancement proposals, something called KEPS. Uh, and and, and this, the idea of this is a living document. And... Uh, and, and it describes an enhancement, records decisions, uh, looks for alternatives, and, and it's meant to be very lightweight initially and be able to be fleshed out over time. So we adopted a form of this in Kudo called the Kudo Enhancement Proposal. And the reason we did that is because Kudo doesn't have special interest groups, whereas the Kubernetes caps, those are all typically organized down into the, at the at different special interest group layer levels so that domain experts can be aware and work on those tools. Kudo is just Kudo. And cuddle is just cuddle, so we didn't really need something very heavyweight, right? So we we stripped out some of that boilerplate and just work with that. And as I mentioned, like these are living documents. So when someone goes to, and, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, when someone comes in and wants to contribute, right? Uh, we ask them to do just enough design initially. And so when you walk in the door, you open the contributor guide. You see, okay, here's how I here's how I do a cap. 
and just give me the summary of the motivation, uh, your your goals and your non goals for what you're wanting to try to solve. Like focus around the problem, right? And and a part of that was to enable new contributors to easily propose functionality and easily take ownership. And uh, you know, we we actually even have this process gra uh, documented as its own cap, actually, so that people can come and uh, and figure out exactly how to do this and exactly how to participate in our community. So we made it very easy to participate in our project management process. And, and from there, uh, people can come in and find out how we do work and, and work with us should they choose to. So one other thing is, is, is part of growing your users is also very much about enabling them. And I think I'm close on time actually, so I'm gonna move a little bit faster. Uh, documentation is very much part of your product, right? Uh, you know, we, we actually do onsite docathons where every team member focuses on exclusively writing docs for a period. And the thing to remember and, and keep in mind, contrib contributions are not just code and contributors aren't just developers. Anyone can jump in, anyone can contribute. There's designers, there's technical writers, there's marketers, anyone can participate in open source. Uh, it, 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 you know, it is very important to not just think of that, oh, well, you know, developers work on this, they just write code and boom, you have an open source project, right? This is a holistic thing. Um, and then managing customers, uh, on, you know, open source project has customers like anything else. You know, talk to customers, make them easy for it to talk to you. Kudo has a Slack channel in the Kubernetes Slack. We are available in CNCF Slack app delivery. We're in every little operator place in, in the open source community you can think of so that we can, we can gather information, talk to people, and, and, and build a better thing for everyone. And it's really important to solve the xyproblem.info. Um, if, you know, if you go look at that link, it's, 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 you know, people will come to you often with, uh, you know, developers especially, come to you with exactly what they think they want. And because they've gone through and, and they have so much context on a problem, then they get stuck on a step that is 10 you know, layers down into their problem domain. And it's really important, we discovered with Kudo, to pull them back up to the problem, right? If someone's trying to work around how to build a specific thing into an operator, how do I run a daemon job? It's like, okay, let's back up. Whoa there, let's, what are you trying to do, right? What's, what's your problem statement? And from there, we're able to actually go, uh, and because we commit heavily to, to APIs design, we want the right API because that's very hard to change later. We've actually come up with better APIs than just solving that problem for them because we can apply problems out to multiple customers. We may not be able to apply uh, a, you know, a hack out to 10, 20 end users. And avoid building the, the, the one tool to rule them all. Yeah, know what your domain is, right? Just because a customer is asking for it, uh, well, they may want to go use a different tool entirely. And so using your problem is inappropriate. Don't just dilute your, your project because in that case, you won't be able to really come up with a focused goal of what this thing should be doing. Um, growing contributors, make it safe and easy to contribute. Uh, code of conducts are very important as well as the ability to talk to people about code of conducts. Uh, it creates a professional environment and uh, so you know, soft, software is a profession and, and people should just be working professionally. And if you're working the CNCF and Kubernetes projects anyway, uh, you, you're part of that professional environment. So. Uh, I like you know, like also putting contr contribution guidelines alongside the project. We did that in Kudo, and because we've made it into made it really easy for someone to come in and get started, uh, and then bringing contributors into that go governance and in enabling shared ownership. Right? Uh, we you know it's it's very important. It was very important to us in Kudo to not just take contributions and then not give anyone sort of any sort of ownership over the, these projects at all. So that's it for me. Uh, I'm I'm three minutes early. Uh, I really appreciate the time, everyone. Jared, thanks so much. That was awesome. That was great. You know, it's it's super fun to see, uh, um, you know, a, a case study of all the different things that we've been talking about all morning and, and all the pieces pieces coming together. I thought in the last minute or so I would ask a question, um, and uh, uh, I, so I'm curious. So on one of the slides, you said. Uh, you know, you kind of were given the timeline, and if I, if I was reading that slide correctly, it was a year, <laughs> or or year and a little more to donate Kudo into the CNCF, which seems seems like a long time. Seems like you know only someone really robust, a project that's really robust with some serious tenacity, could could enable a timeline like that. So I wanted to ask you if you could kind of chat with folks about um, you know thoughts you have, perspectives you have, advice you have for people either in the, in the process or going to be in the process and are, 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 you know, to not get burnt out to that. Sure, so the process is very different 
uh, today than it was uh, when we started that. Uh, the, 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 the technical oversight committee came up with a much more streamlined process that would help them grow. Um, at that point, you had this influx of projects coming in and uh, an a, a, a oversight committee that couldn't keep up and, and needed to find ways to scale, right? So uh, through that, we uh, we followed along with the process and, and, and helped out the best we could um, through the, you know, uh, finding the right SIG or creating creating the actual notion of CNCF SIGs, um, you know, finding the right SIGs to go to and then participating in that new process. So my advice today is, is it's actually much easier, especially for the sandbox. Um, and the best thing you could really do is get involved with the CNCF uh, SIG that you think your project might go into early into that when you when you're thinking about doing that and start talking to them right and they're in front of it present it at the sig uh, you don't even need to be donating it to present it but then uh you know once you once once they're all aware of it they're much better prepared to do a a technical uh deep dive into it and figure out if it's if it's appropriate to move through the cncf right um at this point now the toc does a batch uh, acceptance of projects into the in, into the TOC, so it's really up to those special interest groups to do the work of actually vetting the projects. Awesome, awesome, cool. Um, so I think what we're going to do, folks, is um, we're going to take a break here, um, and we'll be back in just a second uh, with QA with with the panel. Um, but Jared, thanks so much for sharing. I know you'll be back in just a second, and folks can field questions to uh, to Jared then. And by the way, uh, I'd never seen xyproblem.info, so. I'm stoked that you uh, that you shared that. That's great. Okay, we'll uh, we'll be back in just a sec, folks. 